okay, it's 1 p.m. East Coast time, and so we, we, uh, we need to start. So again, welcome to the webinar, Laterality and the Functional Organization of the Brain. Uh, of course, uh, you all know that the brain consists of two halves, but what people sometimes forget is that this bilateral arrangement is not limited to the cortex. We talk about cerebral hemispheres, which implies uh, this bilateral organization of the cortex. Uh, the, uh, but in reality, every other structure, every subcortical structure, is also uh, arranged in pairs. So this bilaterality, this two-halfedness, is a pervasive property of the brain, affecting all the structures, with two exceptions, the pituitary gland and the, the uh, pineal gland. These are the two uh, uh, structures which do not come in pairs. Everything else, both cortically and subcortically, both at the level of the striatum, at the level of the diencephalon, at the, uh, the level of the limbic uh, the system, uh, at the level of the brainstem, everything comes in pairs. So let's keep that in mind because, you know, uh, the, the, we will, in the course of this event, we will, our discussion will not be limited to the neocortex. It will also involve a variety of sub subcortical structures. Well, hemispheric specialization has been one of the major themes in neuropsychology and in cognitive neuroscience. Uh, and there have been several strands of research which contributed to understanding of hemispheric specialization. We'll talk about each of them separately. Of course, the classic observations by Broca and Wernicke uh, the, uh, can be credited with being the first uh, the kind of a, uh, the, uh, uh, formally documented features of hemispheric specialization. Uh, that we, uh, the, uh, there has been a lot of interest uh, and continues to be a lot of interest in the functional uh, dichotomy uh, the, uh, the, uh, to capture the difference between the two hemispheres, whereby one of the two hemispheres, the uh, left hemisphere, the right-handed individuals, uh, that is considered the verbal hemisphere, and the, uh, the, the other hemisphere, the, uh, the, do, uh, the uh, right hemisphere in uh, the uh, right-handed people, has been regarded as being involved in non-verbal dichotomy. And then through some, you know, sequence of quirks, if you will, this distinction between verbal and non-verbal uh, the, uh, uh, the functions of the two hemispheres morphed into something more specific, and people often talk about uh, the, uh, the verbal uh, left hemisphere and the visuospatial right hemisphere. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, much of our understanding about hemispheric specialization can be credited to uh, the research involving split-brain patients. We'll talk about that too in, in more detail. Much of our understanding about hemispheric specialization uh, that can be credited to the studies of patients with colossal agenesis. And then uh, there, used to, there was a surge of work on hemispheric specialization sometime in the late 60s, 70s, uh, the 80s, through the 80s, using all kinds of low-tech devices like tachistoscopes and dichotic listening devices. Uh, the, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, there was a proliferation of studies precisely because these technologies uh, were so, uh, so low-tech and so inexpensive and so easy to, uh, the, to operate. So let's talk about each of these kind of a types of contribution to our understanding uh, the, the, of hemispheric specialization and to what they truly contributed and also to various caveats linked to each of these strings of research. Uh, let's talk about them separately. So uh, classic uh, findings by Broca and Wernicke. So sometime in the middle of the 19th century, uh, the French neurologist Broca described the case uh, the, the, with, focal, with a focal lesion in the posterior portion of the frontal lobe, and he claimed uh, that uh, as a result of this lesion, the patient uh, lost uh, capacity for expressive language, whereas receptive language remained intact. Now, sometime later, about 20 or, uh, 10 or 15 or 20 years later, uh, the, a German neurologist, Wernicke, came up with a complementary finding. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, now we're talking about a lesion in the posterior portion of the left temporal lobe, claiming that this lesion resulted in, a, uh, in an aphasia characterized by a deficit of receptive language, whereby uh, the, uh, the, uh, the expressive language remained intact. Okay? So this, among other things, led to this distinction between expressive and receptive language. Uh, the, and to this day, there are tests.